Well, let me first of all thank uh, Anna and the project for inviting me to speak here. It's my privilege and pleasure to be able to do this. Uh, I must apologize for speaking in English and <coughs> hope that you can follow me. Um, as I was preparing my talk, I found that to some extent, I realized actually that this year is 50 years since I became an economist, academic economist, and it's almost as if my whole <coughs> academic work for 50 years across many fields and topics has been a journey to give just this seminar today, or this presentation today. And so the question is, how can I bring all of this together? Uh, many, many different topics, as you will see, which I think is going to make much more demands upon you. Within 40 minutes, you've got to understand 50 years' work, whereas I've had 50 years to do it. So it's going to be hard for you, because each of these topics itself could take up all of my time, and has done in the past. Uh, so I've got to find a way to cover all of these topics, and uh, as some of you will already know, the way I do this is by using abbreviations. So there's going to be a lot of abbreviations uh, in what uh, comes, and abbreviations are short, and I will touch on each of the topics uh, only briefly themselves, and very unevenly, if also trying to draw out some synthesis. So I first begin with what's in the name of my topic, uh, social, <coughs> social reproduction, SR. Yeah, that's my first abbreviation. Now, social reproduction uh, is primarily, uh, has its origins in and is used heavily within Marxist political economy. Uh, and it takes as its critical point of departure, economic reproduction, uh, as laid out in, particularly, in volume two of Capital, ER for economic reproduction. And the starting point, really, for social reproduction in this framework of Marxist political economy is around how is labor power reproduced. And this is taken as a critical point of departure because the argument is that within capital itself and within volume <coughs> two of capital in the what are called the famous economic reproduction schema, the labor power is presumed to be reproduced merely by producing and paying for the wage goods of capitalists. And this is inadequate, insufficient, negligent, uh, many other even worse criticisms, because it neglects social reproduction. That is, in particular, uh, uh, many years ago, this, there would have been emphasis on the role of women's work within the household, domestic labor, the double oppression of women, and so on. Interestingly, more recently, possibly over the last five years or so, social reproduction and its distinction from economic reproduction has had something of a revival. And that revival, or renewal, is, has been in the context both of austerity and this new trendy term, intersectionality. I haven't got an abbreviation for that, maybe we'll call it IS or something, I don't know. <laughs> intersectionality, which emphasizes not only the oppression of women <coughs> as a result of the role of domestic labor in reproducing labor power, but also oppression by race, ethnicity, and so on, as well as by gender. And that's where the intersection between these different forms of uh, uh, oppression comes from. Now, in my view, uh, taking a longer view, really, this tends to lead not necessarily, but has tended to do so, to two weaknesses within the literature. The first is an undue focus upon reproduction of labor power of the oppressed, uh, as well as neglect of the broader context or factors involved in reproduction of other classes and other aspects of reproduction. Um, 
uh, there's the reproduction under capitalism, not only of the oppressed, or the doubly oppressed, or the triply oppressed, but also of the oppressors. So social reproduction, and indeed economic reproduction, are not just about labour power, they're about all classes and their relations to one another, and so we need to look at the reproduction of the oppressed and the oppressor. In addition, um, there is reproduction other than the material reproduction of the workforce. There's the political and ideological reproduction of the workforce. Again, not only of the workforce, but in its relationship to other classes, as well as race, gender, ethnicity, and so on. A further problem... So <coughs> I'm bringing up lots of problems here. A further problem in the new literature, and indeed in the literature more generally, uh, if we look back into the past, is there tends to be a construction of social reproduction and economic reproduction as a dualism, as one relative to the other. Economic reproduction interacts with social reproduction. Whereas I want to argue very, very strongly, perhaps it's the significance for this may not come out so much, is that economic reproduction is not something that sits alongside social reproduction, like the factory sits alongside <coughs> the household, but that economic reproduction is contained within social reproduction. Uh, it is part of social re reproduction. How am I doing so far? All right, so, okay, yeah. Uh, in addition, there is another issue we have to deal with, and I, I don't think this is a, a, a fault in the literature, but uh, I want to bring it to the forefront, is we also have to deal not only logically with the relation, or methodologically, of the relationship between economic and social reproduction, but also we have to deal with them historically, how they transformed, how they changed over time, and so on. And the way in which I want to signal this is that we're not just talking about reproduction, which is kind of static in its, its uh, vocabulary, but we must talk about restructuring as well. How is re economic reproduction and its containment within social reproduction restructured in particular ways? How does the structures, the relations, the agencies, the processes, how are these transformed by historical processes uh, and not just fitted within a logical structure, whether it be economic within social reproduction or economic alongside social reproduction. So not only do I have <coughs> ER, economic reproduction, but I also have economic reproduction and restructuring. So now we've got the abbreviation ER squared, and we must not only have social reproduction, but we must have social reproduction and restructuring. So we have ER squared, contained within SR squared, okay? Uh, that's my first point. So we're going to look at, the re if we want to look at the relationship <coughs> between economic and social reproduction, we have to start from the point that economic is contained within social reproduction and that they also both uh, involve restructuring of those relations, both within economic re reproduction and within social reproduction. Methodologically, this points to a systemic analysis. So we want to have a systemic analysis of individual parts, because economic is contained within social reproduction, and how they are interrelated with one another. Despite my seeing social reproduction as the totality <coughs> within which economic reproduction is contained, I still maintain that, I suppose as a self-interested political economist, that economic reproduction and restructuring can be seen as an object of study in its own right. And not least with Marx's own theory of how capitalist production tends to develop. I can't run over this, but Marx clearly has a very, very sophisticated methodological, theoretical, and indeed empirical and historical analyses of the formation of large-scale industry, how this relates to other forms of lesser uh, advanced production, how these different types of production not only relate to one another, but also relate to the distribution and circulation of value, including the role of money and finance. Well, there's three volumes of capital in one sentence, so obviously, again, I cannot, but what I'm arguing is we do have a model 
of the logical understanding of the structure and restructuring and economic reproduction of capitalism from Marx's own uh, work, <coughs> including the roles played by money and finance. We certainly have, whether we agree with it or not, and of course it's extremely controversial, even within those who are committed to Marx's political economy, let alone those who disagree with it, but we certainly ha do have a very powerful analysis of the nature of accumulation and economic reproduction and restructuring uh, uh, from Marx's own political economy. But here I'm going to move on to, in a sense, uh, what some might see as historical, although Marx always uh, made reference to the world economy. Here my next abbreviation is going to be GLOB. And GLOB, you won't be surprised, to learn stands for globalization. Uh, with the immediate, in the current period, obviously leading role played by the globalization of production itself in the forms of multinational corporations, heavily brought to light, I suppose, these days by what has become the global production network uh, approach to uh, value chains and so on. So, however we understand it, we have to recognize that the current world, perhaps I'll come back to this, is one dominated by the global organization of production by multinational corporations. And this has been so for at least 50 years. I do have some rev reservations about the global production network approach, <coughs> uh, actually for which financialization is a major problem for them, because financialization does, is not contained within a global production network within a chain. It actually spans across them. So that creates problems for an approach which looks within uh, production networks alone. Um, so in this light, the starting point in looking at the world economy uh, is not the national or regional economy, but the world economy itself and how at the international level economic reproduction and restructuring is being brought about. So I would say methodologically, irrespective of the current period, but for the entire uh, period of capitalism, economic reproduction and restructuring should start with logical analyses of capitalist forms of production and how their restructuring, reproduction <coughs> takes place at a world level, even if distributed, as they obviously are, across uh, national formations. My next point, then, is that the forms taken by economic reproduction and restructuring and its containment within social reproduction and restructuring goes through definite, what should we call them, logico-historical stages. Defined by, what defines a different stage of capitalism is the ways in which this restructuring and reproduction occurs. These definite stages uh, I think are heavily tied to the nature of production. The first stage of capitalism is the one dominated by the production of, to use the theoretical term, which may or may not be familiar to you, is dominated by the production of absolute surplus value in what is generally thought of as the competitive stage. The next stage is dominated by the production of relative surplus value, or for what is generally thought of as the monopoly stage of capitalism. And the, the third stage of capitalism has been one heavily dominated by state intervention in the processes of economic and social reproduction in what I think is somewhat misleadingly called the Keynesian stage. Because when we think about Keynesian, it's about manipulating short-term demand. But the post-war period of capitalist restructuring and reproduction was one in which the state was involved, intervened in many, many more ways, and many, many imp more important ways than simply manipulating short-term macroeconomic variables. Uh, and that Keynesian period was itself, though, one heavily dominated by the internationalization of production. This is where we got the rise of multinational corporations from during the uh, expansion of the post-war boom. And indeed, in many ways, the role of state intervention was not only to restructure the domestic economy and the domestic society, but also to promote that internationalization with the US to the front and the UK not far behind. Well, a long way behind, because it's not so big. 
By the way, this periodization of capitalism into these three stages is not particularly controversial in terms of the timing and to some extent the naming of the stages. What's more in controversial is how they are interpreted. And here I do want to, to make a point uh, that is there are considerable controversies how we should understand the different stages of capitalism. And I want to point, bring this to the fore because critically uh, I think it's a hangover from the post-war boom even as you'll see, a long after that hangover should have been cured, we tend to think of neoliberalism as not Keynesianism, as somehow a departure from the success of the post-war boom. So neoliberalism is in some sense the mirror image of, the negative image of, the departure from Keynesianism. That is, we define neoliberalism by what it is not, not by what it is. And that's true, I've, I've had a made a career out of saying these different approaches to the nature of capitalism do not get to grips with the nature of neoliberalism. I can list them all for you. Fordism is in one. Neoliberalism is not, not Fordism. Also, the regulation theory has actually sort of more or less disappeared because it's been incapable of dealing with the end of Fordism. The social structures of accumulation has had to transform itself completely. Varieties of capitalism cannot deal... If you think about it, most of these paradigms were actually produced just as, as Keynesianism was coming to an end and trying to seek how do we sustain it. Post-Keynesianism is still deeply rooted in the idea of how do we restore Keynesianism. The developmental state paradigm was, is, was a product of the Keynesian period. Social compacting, welfare regime approaches, all of these take really a, have their roots in what is the nature of the Keynesian period and why are we, how are we differing from it? But the truth is, neoliberalism has been with us for longer than Keynesianism. Keynesianism was with us, namely 40 years, and there was 10 years getting it established in the first place. So really our task is not to take these old, I think, very tired and irrespective of how valid they are or how useful they are, get rid of these, all of these old approaches and say, how do we have to modify these to specify what neoliberalism is? We just have to throw the whole lot out and start again. Maybe that's controversial. I don't <coughs> so how do I define neoliberalism then? The stage of capitalism which has dominated uh, our lives for the last 40 years with 10 years in the making in the 1970s, and here I have a very, very simple proposition, namely that neoliberalism is the financialized stage of capitalism. So then I have to explain to you what that means, and, but drawing on what I've said already, uh, what I mean is that not only is economic, well, ER squared, economic reproduction and restructuring contained within social reproduction and restructuring, <coughs> but that those processes of R-squared, reproduction and restructuring, are increasingly dominated by, but not reducible to financialization. So we see the financialization uh, as being the nature of the way, increasingly the nature of the way in which reproduction and restructuring are uh, brought about. So that leads me to my next point. Actually, I, when I do financialization, I talk about FIN, F I W N. It's very nice, actually, when you get things like finfrastructure and all sorts of stuff you can do. Fin, financial inclusion is finclusion. You know, you get, you get all sorts of things. With fin. Um, now, financialization is the trendy concept of, of today. It's had an explosive presence across the social sciences, with one major exception, and that's mainstream economics, where it doesn't appear at all, the only place where it's needed. There are good reasons for that, but that's, that's a different seminar. And so it has what is called uh, the characteristics of being both a buzz concept and a fuzz concept. Buzz, everyone says, oh, that's financialization. And the fuzz is, it means whatever you want to or whatever's using it. And actually, this is a consequence of the very early definition, which is probably familiar to anyone who's done any work on financialization at all, the early definition by uh, uh, Jerry Epstein, 
in which financialization is defined, I've even got the quote here, the increasing role of financial motives, listen to this, financial motives, markets, actors, and institutions. Now, does that exclude anything? Actors, motives, markets, and institutions in the operation of the domestic and the international economies. So can you see financialization is buzz and fuss, is everything. Basically, um, this is an invitation to say wherever money is present, we can talk about financialization. However, although I've, obviously this is uh, to some degree a criticism of the collective nature of what I call fin lit, the financialization literature, uh, the fin lit is incredibly informative about the nature of contemporary capitalism. All right, so I'm very, very strong and in favor of the financialization concept precisely because it captures what has been going on in contemporary capitalism for the last 40 or more years. And from that literature, there are three broad conclusions that I draw. The first conclusion that I draw is what the literature points to is that financialization is, however you define it and however you use it, there's a massive literature now, however you define it or use it, what it shows is that there is an extensive degree of dysfunction in the capitalist economy arising out of short-termism, speculation, the predominance of financial interests, etc., over more functional uh, operation of the capitalist economy. I think, I mean, I don't have any problems with the empirical literature demonstrating this again and again and again, the extent to which, however you define financialization, it has had quite extraordinarily uh, dysfunctional uh, influence over the functioning of the capitalist economy. The second conclusion you can draw, and these are, as the literature has developed over the last 15 years or so, is that the incidence of financialization, that is, how much of it there is and where it is, and the impact of that incidence is very mixed. It's not the same everywhere. And that's where I think uh, we, I like to use the word, it will come up again, that if we look talking about financialization, <coughs> uh, then financialization is shown to be variegated. That's going to be abbreviated by a V, by the way. So, so we can't say, oh look, finance and financialization always does this same thing. It hampers investment, it reduces wages, it encourages austerity, etc., etc. No, it's a bit more complicated than that. That's the, that's the thrust of financialization. But that is not always the case. I actually have two very important counterexamples to that to some extent, uh, in terms of the idea that there's limited investment, etc., etc., as a result of financialization. One of these is climate change. You know, we can't <coughs> both argue that neoliberalism, financialization, etc., etc., is leading to this overaccumulation in the energy sectors with climate change, etc., at the same time as arguing, oh, the impact of financialization is to stop and to impede the development of accumulation. In the energy sectors, financialization has been incredible for overaccumulation, if you like, excesses. Financialization is, as we know, in speculation, but in the real economy as well, financialization can be. Uh, in, engaged in what I call the political economy of excess. Uh, another one uh, is on which I've, I haven't worked so much on climate change, but one area in which I have worked on is food. In food, financialization has not brought this about, but has incredibly intensified the overproduction of food and the overnutrition of ourselves. Actually, if I've got time, I can talk a little bit about that in the case <coughs> of Portugal. Um, but so this is really to make the point very, very briefly that the ways in which financialization exerts its influence and the extent to which it do, does so is not always the same. It's highly, highly uneven across sectors, locations, and so on. And then the third conclusion I want to draw is that across the first conclusion was 
financialization tends to be dysfunctional. Secondly, nonetheless, it's uneven in its, or variegated in its impact and effect. And then the third point is, within the literature, there's been relatively little grounding of these propositions within, or these empirical observations, within theory. Now, the theory of financialization is seriously uh, underdeveloped. So the question then is, how do we fix what I call this thin X syndrome? Financialization and X. What you'll find in the literature, oh, I've worked on this factor X before. It could be climate, could be food, could be housing. Could be, and what I will do is just say, well, financialization makes it worse. Uh, um, and there, really, there's very little causal analysis because the notion is, oh, look, more money is present here, and therefore... That explains what this consequence is, and we show there's a correlation between the extra presence of something called financialization and causal outcomes. So how am I going to deal with this? And once again, I'm going to go back to Marxist theory of political economy, and in particular, rely upon and, and give a very, very narrow definition of financialization. Because if you have a broad definition of financialization, wherever you see the presence of money or even monetary motives or monetary influence, you're going to say, oh, that caused it. So the problem is that your cause and effect become one and the same thing. So I want to go to a very <coughs> narrow definition of financialization, and here I will draw upon uh, Marx's theory of what he called interest-bearing capital. And for Marx, again, I could spend a whole seminar on this, but I can't, defined interest-bearing capital as the advance of money, not just as a loan, but in order to make more money. And so the success of that interest-bearing capital is contingent upon appropriating the surplus that is produced in some other way as a result of the application of that money. So the idea is that interest-bearing capital creates a claim on a stream of future revenues possibly profits or whatever, as in a share, for example. A share says, oh, the interest will be <coughs> not just interest, if I lend you some money and you pay me back, that's not interest-bearing capital. If I lend you money to pay me back by engaging in an enterprise which generates a profit out of which you pay my interest, that that is interest-bearing capital. So interest-bearing capital does create the potential for a stream of income. That stream of income can be securitized into the value of an asset, I hope that people can follow this, it's not, not such a big deal. And that asset then can be bought and sold as, as our shares and so on. Uh, and this is what Marx called fictitious capital, FC, sorry, we've got IBC as interest-bearing capital. But interest-bearing capital can itself be securitized into an asset, which can then be traded as fictitious capital. So the thing that is traded is the claims on the future revenues as opposed to the real assets themselves. So it's not that it's fictitious in the sense it doesn't exist, it's fictitious in the sense that it is distinct from and separate from the real process itself. <coughs> now, I think there's some really interesting things to say about interest-bearing capital and fictitious capital, and these have been highly controversial as well. But what I do insist is that we can see that over the period of neoliberalism, the last 40 years or so, there's been an explosive growth in fictitious capital, over and above the growth in real capital. And this is quite clear in the fact that the number of financial assets or the volume of financial assets in the world economy over that period has increased by three times more than output. Right? So what we're basically saying is that every unit of output that we make is attached to three times as many financial assets as before. And I like to, this is actually an extraordinary example of the dysfunction I referred to before. So that to make this chair, we need three times as many financial assets to make this chair as we needed 30 or 40 years ago. If we, used, if we did the same thing materially, it would have 12 legs, uh, three seats, and so on. It would be an extraordinarily technological decay. So why do we need three times as many assets to produce something today as we did 30 or 40 years ago? 
And so for me, oh, that's something I forgot. So for me, financialization is not the growth of mortgages as such, for example, but it's the growth of the bundling up of those mortgages into assets which are then subsequently traded as a source of making money. So monetary relations as such, even <coughs> borrowing and lending as such, is not financialization. It's actually uh, the creation of assets out of those. Okay. How am I doing so far? Yeah. So in short, what I would argue is that over the period of neoliberalism, <coughs> there has been what I've called both the intensive and extensive financialization of economic reproduction and restructuring and social re reproduction and restructuring. And these are the key elements of neoliberalism, that it's financialization which is bringing about ER squared contained within SR squared. By intensive, I mean within those areas where their finance was already present. Interest-bearing capital is not new, it's been around for hundreds of years, otherwise Marx couldn't have identified it. But it's been expanded enormously within its traditional areas of operation, but it's also been, as we will see, extended to new areas of operation, uh, what people will often call the financialization of everyday life. So. Neoliberalism for me is not just austerity, it's not just market ideology. <coughs> Indeed, neoliberalism is not associated with the withdrawal of the state in practice. It's not just privatization, it's not just commercialization. It's all of these, but more in terms of the forms taken by the financialization of restructuring and uh, reproduction. Okay, so the, I'm beginning to get somewhere, I hope. Now I want to move to a slightly different point and to talk about neoliberalism. So what I've said is neoliberalism is the financialized stage of capitalism because it's financialization which is governing to a larger or greater extent economic and social reproduction and restructuring. I now want to argue that neoliberalism has gone through two previous phases and I'm going to talk about the current third phase in a minute. The first <coughs> two phases <coughs> are heavily associated, at least with those who follow development, and at least in the realm of scholarship, by the distinction between the Washington Consensus and the post-Washington Consensus. Under the first phase of neoliberalism, it was privatized, introduce the market, let the state open up the market, etc., etc., uh, without regard to the consequences. And, the, and that's most clo closely associated with the Washington Consensus, for example, the second stage is very much associated with, uh, and that's Reaganism and Thatcherism. The second stage is very much associated with Blairism and Third Wayism, uh, and the idea of continuing the financialization of the economy, but intervening to deal with the worst dysfunctions that that has uh, created. And now what I want to, perhaps more relevant for us now, is, well, I have another point to make, which is we shouldn't, when we're looking at different stages of neoliberalism, we shouldn't just look at their ideology, we shouldn't just look at their policies. Um, uh, uh, we need to look at ideology, policy, and scholarship together, and they're not necessarily consistent with one another. But well, that's, that's, let's put that on one side. What you might be more interested in is uh, the third phase of neoliberalism, what I see as the current phase, and this is marked by three features. The first is the impact of the global financial crisis, although I would argue that this third uh, phase um, <coughs> predates the global financial <coughs> crisis. Uh, but <coughs> what we've seen in response to the global financial crisis of, of 2007-8 was unpre unprecedented and telling measures Oh, that's my place. Uh, measures to sustain national and global finance. I mean, neoliberal, neo I don't want to give you an indication of this. You know, just the rescuing of AIG insurance uh, involved more money than was, was necessary to provide water and sewage throughout all the world's major cities. You know, the degree of state intervention to rescue finance during the course of the crisis has been quite extraordinary. So one thing that the global financial crisis revealed was the extent to which national and global financial interests were 
uh, to the fore. Another one is the stunning failure to be able to renew or sustain uh, a, a new phase of accumulation. Um, even though, I would argue, I could go through all the details with about ten different factors, if you ask, if, you, if we sit, sit back and ask, are conditions favourable for capitalist accumulation? They couldn't be better. They just couldn't be better. You know, we've got declining strength in trade unions, we've had a huge increase in the global labour force, we've had the losing of the Cold War, etc. Et we've had, I think the most important thing, we've had the extraordinarily sustained <coughs> numbers of technological innovations. You know, so, why isn't capitalism booming? And we all know it's, may I use the English vernacular, finance has fucked it up. I mean, that, that's basically what has happened. So, the sec first feature is, is that we do have unprecedented intervention to support finance. Second is there's been no renewal, or sustained renewal of accumulation, despite quite extraordinary favourable conditions. And last, and perhaps the most important thing, the third or new phase of neoliberalism is one which involves intensified, if uneven, collaboration between finance and industry and the state in the attempt to renew accumulation. What I called finfrastructure earlier, the financialization of infrastructure, is one element of that. So is the new industrial policy. So is the attacks to privatize our health and other areas of uh, <coughs> economic and social reproduction. So nothing could be better in this uh, current phase of neoliberalism, nothing better could illustrate the inconsistencies between neoliberal ideology and practice, with the state currently essentially using its resources to support the role of private finance in public provisioning at the same time as purveying the ideology that the market is superior to the state. It's quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, uh, one point here which I think will be of relevance, I hope, to your discussion of Portugal is to emphasize that when I've talked about these three stages of, of neoliberalism, these are logical, they have a certain <coughs> historical validity as well, but the national times and incidents are subject to shifts and overlappings according to national conditions. And indeed, what's quite interesting about the latest phase of neoliberalism, one, neoliberalism is it's one in which those areas of economic and social production which were hard to privatise, which were hard to subject to neoliberal policies, have actually, actually led to the fore in terms of the attention that's being given them, to them by state and generally uh, global capital, especially for economic and social <coughs> infrastructure. So whilst the first phase, most obviously, of neoliberalism and its financialization was associated with privatization of industries, nationalized industries, and so on, the current phase is one of the state supporting the private finance and private sector to undertake economic and social infrastructure. What I do want to argue though, as I said, is that these logical stages don't necessarily follow the same pattern in one country and another. One country I know most about, I suppose, is South Africa, and what it has done in a sense has had an overlapping embracing of all stages of neoliberalism uh, because it only sort of entered that world in the post-apartheid period from the early 1990s. There may be similar, if you like, concertinas or fractures or overlappings in the Portuguese case uh, as well, for all sorts of reasons. Okay, so what I've tried to argue so far, and I, I, actually I haven't got it here, but I should, I should say it, there's some very, very interesting work by geographers and by what are called econophysicists looking at who runs the world economy. And it's foreign and by their networks, their interlocking ownerships, etc., etc. And basically, it's three to four hundred multinational corporations, two thirds of which are financial. <coughs> so, if you're asking, you know, who's doing the business? Who is actually running the world economy in terms of producing, financing, and so on? It's a relatively small number of very large multinational corporations, uh, two thirds of which are financial. Uh, corporations. But this then raises the question, so what I've been telling you something about is that if we're looking at economic reproduction and if we're looking at economic restructuring, this is financialized 
multinational uh, production, distribution, etc., <coughs> which is the way in which this economic restructuring is, and is taking place. But then I want to raise the question, how am I doing? All right for time? Ten more minutes? Yes. Oh dear. Then I want to raise the question of um, how does this relate to the broader definition of financialization, which isn't just about multinational corporations and so on, it's about every aspect of economic and social life. And here, what I argue is you have to unpick some distinctions between within financialization between what it is and what are its effects. Thus, for example, if we do privatize the nationalized industry, uh, it then produces commodities for profit, that creates assets which are then sold, that is what I call commodification with a big C, and that is the classic example, if you like, of financialization. Um, but we also have another set of phenomenon identified within the literature which are different from that. So, for example, we may have provisioning that is not fully commodified, um, uh, such as user charges for if it's transport or health or housing or anything else like that. In this case, we still generate streams of income which can themselves be securitized into an asset and sold, so we do get financialization, but we don't get necessarily privatized forms of commodity production. And this is what I call, instead of commodification with the big C, this is what I call commodity form. So it has the form of commodity because money is exchanging hands, right? but it's not full privatized commodity production. So I call that commodity form. And the last thing is we may actually have the influence of financialization or financial motives over the way in which we organize things, but in which money does not itself uh, actually pass hands. So, for example, I don't know how the university system works in Portugal, but you might say, oh, look, we're going to quantify how many students you have, we will allocate funding on this basis, or we'll have poverty indices and we will allocate funding to different regions according to those poverty indices, etc., etc. So this is a commodity form. It involves creating monetary calculations, but it doesn't actually create any streams of revenue which can be turned into assets. And this I call commodity calculation. Now the problem with the thin lip, the problem with the financialization literature, is it rounds all of these all up into the single thing which they usually call commodification, and they say this is financialization. So wherever you see commodification, or wherever you see the commodity form, or whether you see, what was the last one, commodity calculation, this is all seen as financialization, as if it's all part and parcel of the same thing. And my argument is, no, this is not the case, that we have to draw a distinction between these different ways in which finance may have an influence on the way in which provisioning takes place, because that is very important in understanding both economic reproduction <coughs> and its relationship to social uh, reproduction. On the other hand, it is the case that the dynamic of neoliberal, if you like, globalized, financialized neoliberalism is one in which commodity calculation is the first step in going towards commodity form and is then the next step to going towards commodification itself. Um, as I said, there's some merit in this. Um, but matters are not so simple. Uh, as brought out, for example, by the supposedly decommodifying of health in the UK. And the, the idea is everyone gets health free at the point of delivery. But behind the scenes of that, there's actually, it's heavily in the news now because the ac accusation by Corbyn against Johnson that they're going to open up the medical sector to uh, US interests. I've got news for you. It, it's already been opened hugely. The whole dental service in the UK is owned by multinational corporations, just like the, uh, the water system is. Um, but here the argument is uh, that even though on the one hand we seem to have decommodified health by making it free at the point of delivery, behind the process of delivery itself, there are major multinational corporations increasingly taking over the provision of those, those services. So more generally, the relations across 
commodification, commodity form, and commodity calculation, sorry, that's CCFCC, <laughs> just another abbreviation for you. Uh, more generally, they are complex and contradictory. I hesitate, given our next speaker and expert being in the audience here, a neat example of this is housing benefit to support those in private rented accommodation, accommodation as absolutely and completely mushroomed across the whole of Europe as the opposite side of the coin of the promotion of owner occupation. So commodification on the one hand leads to some degree of commodity ca calculation and uh, removal. Uh, and this is a more general example around the tensions of promoting financialization, but when you have to deal with the residualized who are unable to obtain their social reproduction through such mar market forms. Okay, how long have I got? Two more minutes. Two! <laughs> okay, I have to be very quick. Okay, given I've only got two minutes, uh, my next thing that I want to talk about, which will be familiar to you, but not, to, not to, to others, is something called the system of provision approach. So what I've said is, we've got all of these acronyms leading to financialized economic and social restructuring, and <coughs> my argument is with the CCFCC, with the different incidents, the variegated nature of, of uh, provisioning uh, through financialized, financialized economic and social restructuring, if we want to understand what is happening in housing, if we want to understand what's happening in health, if we want to understand what's happening in food or transport, we have to look at each of those specifically and look at the whole chain of activity from the production process through to the consumption process itself, as well as even uh, disposal. So uh, what, uh, particularly in the work on FESED, in which we looked at... Um, um, housing and water, we need to look at the particular ways in which provisioning is structured uh, in uh, particular sectors and in particular environments. And that is what something called the system of provision approach tries to do, to say the housing system in Portugal is financialized almost inevitably to a greater or lesser degree, but the impact that it has is specific both to Portugal and to the nature of the housing system <coughs> in Portugal itself, and that's quite distinct from the health system in Portugal as opposed to the housing and health systems in the UK. Very, very quickly, I'm going to run through this all now. The system revision approach also places enormous emphasis on what are called social norms. That is the idea that not everyone gets a certain average or something, but the nature of what people get, or what they get, is distributed across the population in particular ways. But equally important is the nature of the way in which delivery takes place. So the norms are not just who gets what, but how, and how that changes. And of course, the argument I've been making is the system of provision approach points to the way in which norms are increasingly being financialized, whether it's owner occupation and mortgages, or whether it's uh, pensions and the privatization of pensioning uh, and so on. And then the one thing I'm saying about financialization and neoliberalism is that this brings what's called V cubed, that because of financialization, not only I talked about variegation before, but we also get volatility and vulnerability because of the spec because of the nature of the way in which social norms are financialized we tend to get extreme vulnerability due to the volatilities associated both with financial markets and the other uh, impacts upon the system of provision. Um, then I talk about it's something called the 10 C's. I haven't got 10 seconds to give a second each to my 10 C's. This is the nature of the way in which we understand these things culturally, what's going on that we're subject to commodification, we're subject to contestation, etc. There are tendencies by which I understand. And each of those will be quite specific to the system of provision. The housing culture will become very different from the health culture, different from the food culture, and so on. And I create this framework for understanding how those cultures interact with the processes of provision itself through the tendencies. Right. 
So, that's what you have to do. You have to look at your social norms, your systems of provision, your, all, all those other acronyms. But I do want to finish, can I have one, more, one or two more minutes? Um, given the theme of our conference, I'm acutely, I've written this out to make sure I get it right, I'm acutely conscious of not having said anything about semi, semi-peripheral financialization and its economic restructuring, reproduction, and social reproduction and restructuring. And there has been some tensions between us in debating this within the project. So let me put my uh, cards on the table, but begin by observing there is a small but growing literature on financialization in developing and emerging countries other than the first world, because US and UK experience has dominated the financialization literature. Uh, this literature, though, has tended to focus upon the continued su supremacy of the dollar and macroeconomic management of balance of payments. It's also looked at the negative role played by the presence of foreign banks, especially in expanding consumer credit to the better off and extracting interest on loans to government or otherwise, with at most some tentative beginnings to attach such a developments to what is going on in production itself. So most of the subordination financial, subordinate financialization literature, trying to say how the third world gets screwed by financialization, doesn't really look at what's happening on in production. This work has tended to appeal to the notion of subordinate financialization. <coughs> so there's, you know, <coughs> naughty United States that's financializing and everyone else is, or to a greater or less, subordinated to that, especially because of the role of the dollar. And this can be or might be extended to the term of peripheral financialization or semi-peripheral financialization. Uh, though this has its different origins, as you'll be aware, within the study of the countries in the EU worst hit by the global financial crisis. So I say, let me put my cards on the table as far as the notion of semi-peripheral financialization is concerned. Yes, there it is, financialization. For me, there is a tension between this approach uh, and what I've outlined as the variegated nature of globalized, financialized neoliberalism. Uh, the question is, are these compatible with one another? Are we going to talk about variegated, subordinated, semi-peripheralized financialization? <coughs> uh, so I bring good news and bad news. The bad news is that the notion of semi-peripheralization has affinities with, with, intended or not, with world system theory, which from my perspective is too structurally rigid and would be unable to account, as it was being put forward by the rise of the East Asian NICs or by the rise of China uh, today. The good news is that the challenge is to identify how semi-peripheralization is subject to economic reproduction and restructuring and social reproduction and restructuring rather than for corresponding structures to be taken for granted, generally put down to be due to low productivity and inability to the value given the euro, which would do little to resolve long-term continuing lesser levels of productivity, but perhaps that will be answered given the title of one of your presentations later. So answering this question requires <coughs> examination of whose economic interests have been served by the forms taken by economic reproduction and social reproduction, rather than those structures being taken for given, and especially how these fit into both domestic and global processes. And maybe I'll be offered some answers to these questions uh, for the rest of the day. So for me, it's not just enough to say we are financially peripheralized or financialized peripherally. It's a matter of saying, well, how does that impact upon all the processes of economic and social restructuring, of which uh, some focus upon production <coughs> uh, is important? I was going to say something about that for food, but I haven't got any time. So, uh, Sorry, that's it. Thank you very much. Now we have some time.